you had a fabulous Thanksgiving. If you are in the U.S., we have a number of Canadians and people from Scotland in other parts of the U.K. I don't think that you guys uh, celebrate Thanksgiving when the Americans do. Go ahead and give me a quick sound check. Make sure that it is um, sounding good on your end. Um, type that so that you can know that, that I'm asking for that. Um, in any case, I'm super excited to have you all here joining us today. Andy will be joining us in a little bit. He has to take care of something with the kids, you know. Um, some of you may also be noticing that our um, studio is a little bit different. It's a little off center. Uh, what we did is we had a new room made available in our house and we, decided to move our office from where it was downstairs and move it upstairs. And now it's here. It's in its dedicated space. It's not sharing. And um, great. Thank you so much for telling me that the sound is good. I appreciate that. So, all right. So we're going to talk today about the future of genealogy research. Now, this conversation began over on Wikitree, and there were a number of panelists. Um, Thomas McKenty was one. Jen Baldwin was one. Max was uh, moderating. Correct me if I'm wrong. If any of our Wikitreeers remember the rest of the panel, please go ahead and share their names. I don't don't want to leave anybody out. I know there was the the cute blonde with short hair and a, a Catherine. Catherine. I can't remember her last name, but um, Catherine was there as well. And uh, lots of great discussions there. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to give some of our other ideas of what do we expect to happen in the next five years, maybe even 10. We'll stick to five. Um, <laughs> I'll take this question real quick. Is the new room warmer? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. It is definitely much, much warmer. And I like it up here. All right. So back to the topic of what do we expect in genealogy research in the next five years? Um, so let's start with the future of genealogy research. And one viewer said, my hope is that it will become easier to break down brick walls. And that ties into what one of my predictions is. So in, if you're watching live or if you're watching a replay, be like Debbie and tell me what you hope is in store for the next five years for genealogy research. We'll tackle DNA in just a little bit. Okay. So my prediction right now is that the future of genealogy research is going to take advantage of optical handwriting recognition. Optical handwriting recognition. Now, if you've watched our channel before, you know how much I do value newspaper research and how optical character recognition has helped historians and researchers of a variety of subjects access printed typed records. And that became optical character recognition. So optical handwriting recognition was released this year as part of the 1950 U.S. Census indexing project. Now, I have to take you back about five years. So about five years ago, maybe six, if anybody remembers specifically the date, let me know in the chat. But I remember at the Innovator Showdown as part of Roots Tech, which if you haven't registered for Roots Tech, let's go ahead and put a plug for that. I will be speaking in two sessions live in Salt Lake in the first weekend of March. But back to the topic. Um, at Roots Tech, they had an Innovator Showcase, and one of the companies that made the finals was called Argus Search. And Argus Search was an optical handwriting recognition software program. And I so wanted them to win. I don't think they won. I think some other technology won and they were first or second, uh, second or third place. In any case, that was about within the last five years that this technology has been coming forth. Well, then about, uh, the two years before the COVID uh, lockdown at Roots Tech, and then the, the year after, so the year before, how do I say it? In 2020, there was a Roots Tech live, and then we had lockdown, right? So I remember talking to engineers at Family Search and Ancestry, and they were predicting that 
there was going to be handwriting technology coming, but they couldn't tell me what. I'm like, oh, darn, why can't you just tell me? And they said, you, you know, hold on tight. It's going to be great. And then finally, the 1950 census came out and handwriting software technology was implemented and brought this uh, record set faster than ever to our use. And that was an exciting development. Now, why do I think this is going to revolutionize genealogy research and tie back to Debbie's point of I hope that it can help me break down my brick wall? Forgive me, I got a, I got a sneeze coming. Oh. <laughs> the reason why I think these two tie together is because what are some of the most difficult record collections for you to access? Let me know in the comments if you're watching live in the chat comments. And if you're watching a replay, tell me the most difficult record collections for you to access. Okay. The reason why I personally think these are connected is because there is a use other than genealogy research for this type of technology. Let's look at court records. Court records are really difficult to access, but a number of court cases, even far into the past, can have an impact on the future. So as optical handwriting recognition can start scanning past court records, it will help those who do court record research, but it will also help historians and genealogists like ourselves try to find our ancestors in those records. Now that would be pretty cool. Um, the other thing that would be uh, accessible from this technology, let's go back here. I see a couple. Um, Sandy, you mentioned church records. Absolutely. I have been processing uh, Mexican church records using the Get Involved app on Family Search. And what this does is optical handwriting recognition has scanned the Spanish church records. And then it's asking me, does this say um, Gonzalez? Does this say De La Cruz or De La Vega? And I say yes or no, or I, I don't know. Somebody else needs to give a stab at it. So I look forward to seeing that help with church records. Now, uh, Crystal had said other language, other languages. Absolutely. Think about this. If we can have optical handwriting recognition for the foreign languages, and if you're German, you understand what I'm talking about. The more modern German records are written in new German. <laughs> and this is the way a friend of mine who is German, he was born in Germany, he was educated in Germany. He said, I read new German. That was his term. I read new German. I can't read the old German. And it's not because it's in a handwriting font. It is because it's an old German. And think about this. If we can have optical character optical handwriting recognition, even Germans will be able to access that old language because they can have it scanned and then have it translated into modern German. And now German researchers who don't speak the old language can make that happen. Pretty fascinating stuff. Let's see other um, recommendations you guys have said. Uh, podunk towns and cities with nothing yet digitized or indexed. Absolutely. Now, optical handwriting recognition technology can apply to these little tiny towns because there's another record collection that these little tiny towns have that benefits non-genealogy record collections. And that is land, right? Land records. When somebody buys a new property, they want to do a title search. They want to make sure there are no liens or fines. They want to know what the boundaries are. They want to make sure nobody has access to or claims to that rec, uh, land so that when it's transferred to somebody else, it's clear. In upstate New York, Andy and I were about to purchase a property um, in 2005. And a few days before closing, the title search came back that it wasn't free and clear. So if there was optical handwriting technology for land records, those title searches would be a whole lot faster. And it could happen within a few days of somebody putting an offer in a property or land or business. 
and then come back and save people time and energy waiting for that property to come to be. So then genealogists will benefit, especially in these little towns, because this was a little town in upstate New York. Here's Andy. A little town in upstate New York that can run those title searches and make those available, saving them money, and then genealogists benefit because we want to do title searches as well. So I really think this is going to be super exciting for genealogy research. Um, and then Ascertain also mentioned, click on that one for me, Ascertain also mentioned synagogue records and Italian records, right? So again, church records, land records. One other one I didn't see anybody um, post, and forgive me if I've missed your comment, probate records. Can you imagine the brick walls that we can break down with probate records with an every name search? And so optical handwriting recognition is definitely the future of genealogy research. Hey, Andy, how Hi. are you? <laughs> I made it. He did make it. He did make it. So um, I'm going to turn the time over to Andy to share his thoughts on what the future of genetic genealogy research is gonna be. I'm gonna go ahead and catch up on some of the comments that you guys left, keep them coming. I really appreciate them. But now that there's two people behind the helm, it'll be easier to check up into. But now's the time for you to tell me what are your predictions of genetic genealogy or what is your hope? Or what do you think might be an obstacle overcome? So Andy, take it away. Future right. of genetic genealogy research. So obviously with genetic genealogy, one of the things that we have is testing. And there's there's right now, I guess, five major companies that do genetic genealogy testing. Um, and the, the number of people that have tested so far is about 35 million, if I remember right. Um, I'm trying to pull up Leia's I was supposed to do this beforehand, but I didn't. <laughs> anyway, so um, so yeah, so about 35 million have tested. And that number continues to go up. Now, not as high as it was going up back in 2018, but we're still adding a couple of million people each year um, to that. So the future, I guess, would say is, is one from a, a market saturation standpoint. I think what you're going to see for those of you who happen to have ancestry from Africa or from Asia, um, you're going to see more and better results over the next few years as those populations and their descendants of those populations are testing more and more. I would say from a... Um, United States, Canada slash European standpoint, at least Western European, we're probably close to market saturation as far as genetic testing. Quick now, question. What is market saturation? Did you define that? I don't think you did. No, you I can, didn't. And so again. the marketer is going to ask the engineer to define market saturation. So market saturation is basically when all the people that are willing to pay for a test have paid for a test, um, in essence. And, and I think that's why we see the, the numbers have, uh, the rate of increase has decreased a lot is because of market saturation in the United States and Europe. Now it'd be great if everybody did, but everybody's not going to. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's been a lot of outreach with some of the different companies to populations in Africa and Asia to bolster those uh, reference sets that they have, but also to bolster the number of people in the database, then of course, that you can match when you think about it, Africa's got a billion people. Asia's got like 3 billion people. So you have more than half of the world's population just on those two continents. And they're the most underrepresented in the DNA databases right now. So I think that's one of the first things that's going to really improve over the next years is those populations are actually going to start to see some of the results that okay. the uh, people in the U.S. have been seeing for a while now. Um, the next thing, hold on. I wanted to show something really quickly about market saturation here. Ooh. Um, you did say, you know, the, the marketing background person is the Check one that's going to, um, ask about market saturation here. Okay. So let me hide this banner real quick. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if you can zoom in on this, what this is, is it a marketer's bell curve, if you will, right? The bell curve. Uh, an engineer can like it. 
So you have the innovators, right? And the earlier adopters. These are people who will but jump on things um, and it doesn't matter the price, they want it early. So and, for DNA, this was the 2001 to about 2010 timeframe. And that would be you. No, actually. No, okay. No, I was not part of this. Okay, I really thought he was a part of it early on, but other people had to precede him so that he was then in the early majority. Okay, the early majority, these are when it started coming to Roots Tech and there were all these crazy deals that you couldn't get on, um, anywhere else but at Roots Tech and it was the buzz. Everybody wanted to know what kind of tests to take. So this was probably 2010 to about 2018 mm -hmm. was right here. Yeah. Pragmatists. Yes. And so what's happening now is I think in the U.S. market particularly, is that we're starting to get into the red zone, that conservative. You're starting to see the drop offs. Um, a number of people have seen that, even though there might be some little bumps and spikes, the tr gen trend is down. Why? Because most of the people who are well, going to- real quick, when you say the trend is down, mm -hmm. you mean the rate of increase. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Not that there's less people there's less people in the database. That's correct. This is people purchasing tests and getting into databases. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and this is when the market threats start increasing. This is fear of um, people not wanting to be in a database because they don't want their DNA test used against them. This is people who are like, you know what? The ethnicity tests have seemed to be inaccurate which andy might touch on these are any these are when people are starting to see more negatives than positives and so the trend is going down but they're still untapped markets so you can have people in the conservative and the red in one location like in the us and you can have people in the green these early adopters in other locations like china or other um countries if they're allowed and right. that's the big question. And I, and I seem to remember recently that Ancestry announced um, several other countries that they're shipping tests to. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, I had a video a while back about what uh, what countries they ship to. And it's really limited, even when you consider most of the companies. Um, it's it was really limited. And, and if you're in North Korea, you're probably not going to get one or Iran, I think. Um, so with with a with more of a global outreach than what you're going to see you're for those of you that are Western European heritage, you're actually probably not going to see much change as far as your number of matches or the quality of matches over time. But for those of you who have, like I said, African heritage or Asian heritage, you're going to see a increase in the number of matches and the quality of those matches as more and more people from those populations test. So that's, that's one thing that is going to uh, change, I think, from genetic genealogy. The second thing I wanted to touch on with genetic genealogy is um, the, how to, how to put it. Uh, Should I spill it? <laughs> I don't know if you, you're spilling okay. what I'm going to spill. Okay. The analytic tools um, and the quality of them. And I, I go back to, again, a video we did I did a while ago about Watto, how Watto is the best genetic genealogy tool out there. And simply because Watto actually lets you look at multiple people in comparison to an unknown relative, mm -hmm. um, which is great. Now, I say that because really in the last year or so, we've looked at the 23andMe tree, which is basically just a genetic tree that is pre-built for you, simply based off of genetics. And that is using that same kind of technology. It's like looking how multiple people are related together. I like to call it the auto auto tree. The auto auto tree. <laughs> That's not what it's really called. But that to me, when he showed it to me and explained it, because remember I'm the Debbie Downer of DNA, just because my there's so many obstacles against me being successful. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's the auto auto. Um, but DNA Painter has released a number of crazy well, tools. Have and, you seen those? Yeah. And, and one of the best ones there right now that I need to do a video on is with the shared CM, where instead of just having one match that you're comparing it, now you can have two. So really what you can look at is you can look at 
let's say two siblings, you know, any relative is going to be the exact same type of relative with those two siblings. And so how much they match each one could eliminate some of those possibilities and help narrow down that field. You can do that same thing with cousins. Again, first cousins that you happen to know the relationship and most of the others that are related to both of them are going to have that same relationship to both of them. Maybe it's a second cousin to both of them or a third or fourth cousin to both of them. So you can use that tool in that way. And why this is important is because for the vast majority of your matches, they fall into the, oh, you know, 10 to 50 centimorgan range where there's a wide number of relationships that can share that simply because, you know, once you get past what about second cousins into the third cousin realm, they can share less than 50 centimorgans all the way down to zero. And then you can have, you know, out to eight, ninth cousins that can share between zero and, you know, 20 centimorgans or so. All right. So Matt says, I wish WADA would go to lower, more distant matches. Um, that's where my bricks are. That would be nice. The the tricky part there has to do with these matches that are all in this zero to 30 range or zero even to 50 range or really zero to 30 range because there's just so many relationships they could be from literally third cousins all the way out to 10th or 12th cousins um, that you may be sharing that DNA with. So um, the tools, being able to use multiple different matches to do comparisons, the more tools that actually implement that, the better. What were you going to say? What? Oh, I think I have, again, I read thousands of DNA related comments. She answers most of them, actually, not me. Well, the easy <laughs> ones. <laughs> Um, if there's a link to a video, Devin's answer. <laughs> right. Um, and because I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot using this channel, listening to him, watching other videos, responding to your comments, reading Andy's responses to comments. The number one problem in the genetic genealogy industry is the focus on ethnicity percentages and not on DNA matches. And the reason why I say that is because there is so much interest in trying to figure out what is my 3% DNA, go look at how many views, and how many comments are on that particular video. We did a follow-up video. Oh, it actually might be even more complicated than you think. People are so confused with the ethnicity estimates. And the original idea when we were having these conversations at Roots Tech behind the scenes with different developers and stuff, it was, oh, we are going to turn these ethnicity estimate interested parties into actual researchers. Let me know in the comments, whether you're watching live or the replay, how many of your DNA matches have trees attached to your DNA? Just curious. And that is because there's so much focus on the ethnicity estimates and not on tree building. The other reason why I say that this is a threat to the genetic genealogy community is because when people come in and they see that there's no US Native American in their ancestry, um, ethnicity results, whether it's ancestry, my heritage, I was just, you know, in their heritage, ethnicity results, they think it is bogus. If they see something that is super, super tiny, and then they look at their tree and they can't figure out where the heck that could be, they think it's a scam. And then when they have experiences like me, where you test with ancestry, you test with my heritage, you test with 23andMe, you put it on GEDmatch or all the different places that have ethnicity and nobody can agree on how much German ethnicity I have, how much English I have and so on and so forth. Those are the, in marketing terms, the betrayed audience. They're gonna constantly come back and say the DNA tests are scams and they're gonna keep poo-pooing that's not an official word, but they're going <laughs> to keep. That's a marketing term. They're going to keep saying that the tests aren't worth it, and the, until things change, that's going to be a threat to the increase in genetic genealogy. How do you move people be, from being initially interested in their ethnicity results into building their family tree? I don't know. That's something that needs to get resolved in the next five years if you want to see more excitement, like we had in the early days. 
Okay. Anything else? Preach, Devin. I'm sorry. I'm not a preacher. I just, <laughs> you know, I just, I see the frustration that people are experiencing when they're coming to our channel and and then even okay so the band director for my two children she teaches the high school she teaches at the middle school for my two younger children and she asked me what dna test do i take and i said well what do you want to find out and she said well i think i have scottish heritage but we haven't really done anything with my family tree i'm like well okay here's what you can do but if you haven't started building your family tree the chances of you figuring it all out might not be accurate and it's not going to be consistent she's like i don't want that then i'm not going to waste my time on the ethnicity report so these are conversations with everyday people going ah you know and since she's my kids band director she didn't have a lot of time, free time to build her family tree just yet so i did invite her to get her family to test but she didn't just let it sit there for a while so anyway there have been some other points that people have made um there was one, it was a really good one. This one, what do you think, Andy? I'd uh, love more chromosome info on Ancestry. <laughs> yes, everybody would. Um, right now they are the only company that I know of that provides nothing. And do you need it? Well, not for most things, but for several things, it is extremely useful. Um, and since Ancestry's got the biggest database, I can't help but wonder if it would be even more useful. And, and well, I mean, Ancestry's, not only does Ancestry have the biggest database, but 23andMe, except for their subscriber network, limits the number of matches that you see to like 2,000 or so. Um, so that limits the amount of information that you actually have chromosome data for. Uh, my heritage is about what a fourth of the size of uh, of what that it is, and family tree DNA is like you know one twentieth the size of of ancestry. So ancestry's got this huge advantage with the size of their database that having chromosome information might actually be really helpful um, with some of the tools that they have coming out. I have a suspicion that they use a lot of that chromosome segment information that they don't show you in order to do stuff. Um, Which, but I can't obviously prove that they do or don't because I don't have access to their chromosome segment information. Which, coming from the genealogist side of things, you always want to validate things. You want to see the documentation before somebody just says, hey, this is your tree match. And you're like, yeah, but show me the evidence. Like, you're telling me they're unmatched doesn't tell me anything. Show me at the chromosome level where they match. And they go, ah, you brought the receipts to back it up. And so it's 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 frustrating. So we can't speak to what the future of ancestry is. That's no, that what she said is a good analogy. So think of it as your DNA match list on ancestry is like an index. It's an index, you know, just like an index for probate records are. Well, it tells you that, you know, this person appeared for this court and it might even tell you the reason, but it doesn't go into any other detail. Um, and that's, that's, you know, really what Ancestry has there is they have an index that we want the record itself. There you go. All right. Here's another um, thing before we move on to the third topic we have. Now, put your predictions, keep them coming. We're going to tackle some of them as we come across. Um, so here is what Stacy said. I think in an obstacle to testing it, some testers have now started to die off and there isn't really a plan in place to future proof for that. So what do you think, Andy? Oh, that's that is actually a, a real concern because there's there's several different schools of thought um, with it. Two main ones. One is that uh, the dead have no right to privacy because they're dead. Um, and if you subscribe to that school of thought, well, then when somebody dies, their DNA should be made public, publicly available for anybody to search and stuff um, on any of the databases. But then there's the other major school of thought that, no, if they did not give permission, then they, you can't. Um, and, uh, and if that's the case, then really their data should be deleted. 
you know, right when they die. So you have these these two schools that are diametrically opposed to each other. They cannot coexist. Um, and as a, I have a problem with the second one. And let me know if you guys also have the same thought. Who gives consent for their land records, their city directories, their birth certificates, their church records? The Catholic Church is constantly in a flux of should we make our records available or are they private? There are a number of Catholic churches that say, no, this is private. We're not, they didn't give consent. No. And others are like, well, this actually could help. You know, people be interested in our records and preserve the lives of people. And so then you apply it to DNA. So if you hold the one truth, as you said, the DNA didn't consent, well, then don't, how does that square with having access to genealogical records like the ones I mentioned? Just a thought. If you agree or disagree, let me know. Um, yeah. No, and I, no, but I think that is, I think that is something that is good to, to bring up because one, genetic genealogy, despite all the advances that we've made, you're talking about something that's 20 years old, literally. It is not older than that. Um, it might be 22 or 23, but it is, <laughs> it is young, really young. When compared to genealogy, well, um, that's a few thousand years old. They've been doing genealogies for a long time. Um, and so in that time period of thousands of years, they've resolved lots of different conflicts. That doesn't mean that all of them are resolved, but they've resolved lots of different conflicts. And so in this case with, with genetic genealogy, this is one that is going to have to be resolved at some point. <clears throat> now, and it's interesting because the dead can't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you can, uh, you can, uh, withdraw your consent all you want. Um, that doesn't prevent some archeologist a thousand years from now from digging up your bones and sequencing your DNA and putting it out there as a uh, Kennewick man or whatever, um, even though you don't consent to that. Uh, so I, I think I think it's an issue that, you know, needs to be debated, you know, publicly and point out the arguments for and against because both sides have, you know, in relation to genealogy, have some really good arguments for, but they also have some really good arguments against them on each side. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was that was a good comment somebody had as far as as far as people dying. Now, the the other thing with people dying and the way that the Davises are right now is how do you pass that on uh, to the next person? Now, different companies have done different ways. For instance, Family Tree DNA they have a way that you can actually designate who can have access to your account afterwards. On the other hand, in this digital world, if they have your username and password, it doesn't matter if they have <laughs> consent, they have access to it. Well, um, and then we've also talked to um, probate lawyers and they're saying that it's better to pass things on when you're alive than when you're dead. And we said, hey, should we put this stuff in our will? She's like, no, it doesn't really help. So there's even disagreements in the legal spheres <laughs> of what you can do. <laughs> yeah. All right. You had another comment or? No, well, I have one more topic. Oh, okay. Switching now, topics again. We are switching topics. And this is the one we're gonna talk about. What are some threats to genealogy research? And this has been weighing on my mind for several years. And Andy, will you pull up, pull up, pull up population statistics or birth rates or something here, Trace? Those kind of statistics. Sure. That's where we're headed. All right. Sorry. Uh, re remember, I said that we were <laughs> relocating our room. <laughs> we did it last day, yesterday, and this morning, and then we had to get our kids to do some cleaning. And so, anyway, so we didn't have anything preloaded. But this is one thing that's on my mind. And that is the threat to genealogy research as, and I've seen this as I've worked with beginning genealogists in my tenure as a family history consultant in Houston, as working in public libraries, teaching people how to do genealogy research, more and more younger folks or people even in my generation, um, and I'm in my 40s, 
they don't know who their parents are, one or both. They don't know who their grandparents are. They have, shall I use colloquial terms, they have baby daddies and don't know who they are. The, as this increases, this, this breakdown in the family continues to increase, the in, interest in genealogy also decreases. As marriage rates and um, birth rates decline, people tend to stop caring about the past. And so I've seen a rise in movements to destroy the nuclear family, to destroy traditional values, to destroy the things that we as genealogy researchers research. And as that increases, my fear is that genealogy research will also decline because why would anybody care? The other thing that I have to back it up is the more in the younger generations, including the, the kids of the age of my children, they are very narcissistic. And you may say, hey, teens are narcissistic. Yes, but not to the degree. I've been homeschooling for 20 years and I've been watching the trends of teens for 20 years. The teens of today are so much into their own bubble and not caring about the past and not caring about their heritage. It makes me wonder, did they not get the message of Mulan and finding her place in her family tree or Coco and discovering he has value once he learned his family history or heck Moana, that she felt this urge to go to the sea. And then her grandma finally told her, hey, before your dad, we were actually part of the tree. We were part of the sea. And so that is a threat. And I don't know if you agree, disagree, what your thoughts are. Andy, do you have some of those things pulled up? I'm looking for one other thing. So okay. Talking. okay. Um, now, Robert has this to say. Um, I agree with what you say, but there might be a rebound in 20 and 30 years. That could be the hope. That, that, that would be the hope. Um, so... Whenever we're in, in marketing, so I have a degree from Texas A&M in marketing. I worked in market research for GFW Airport. One of the things we always talk about is SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we have to put a pin on the threat of genealogists who keep saying, how do we get younger people involved? How do we get younger people involved? And while there are these great tools and there's shall I say, some gimmicks that are used on various websites. I went and taught um, some 12-year-old boys how to look at genealogy records. Um, they were census records and a vital record. Somebody had a birth certificate for their family, and then they had um, a census record for their other family. After going through that process of helping them understand records, the next thing they did was look at, you know, what does my face look like in these other faces? And, you know, how far back can I go? Oh, I'm related to Thor. No, you're not, right? Um, and so it didn't really turn them into researchers with all those little toys, I guess you would say. Um, so, yes, teaching them how to do the skills is important, but we also have to have them have a love for their family. Are you ready? Yeah. So you want to take off Robert's comment there? So I can. can. Mm -hmm. So this is the birth rate. The first, sorry, not the birth rate. The fertility rate, which is births per woman mm -hmm. um, over time. And this is just since 1960. So you can see 1960 for the world, it was roughly about five. And now we're at about 2.4. And really what this translates into is family size. Now, when you think about your own family, as far as who is interested in genealogy, if you and you have what say three or four siblings um and you're the only one interested in genealogy then that's you know one out of five that is interested in in doing genealogy mm -hmm. well as the number of kids in the family goes down and let's say if on average it's one out of five well that means there's going to be a lot of families that don't have anybody interested in doing genealogy because there's not five children per family there's only 2.4 children per family um so that's one of the things that it does it where I guess you could say from a uh, from a research standpoint, you're going to have these branches now that nobody's looking at because there was nobody in that family that was interested in, in looking at that. And that might just be for a, a time, like Robert was saying, hey, there might be a rebound. Um, the, the problem is, is 
when it comes to when it comes to fertility rates over his, history, there's not been very many rebounds. There's been rebounds in population because of things like uh, the Black Death that wiped out, you know, a quarter of the population of the planet. Um, there was actually a big rebound after that. Um, but from general fertility rates, they actually stay pretty stable and, and following trends. And so the fact that we are down to 2.4, it is highly unlikely we are ever going to be back to five. Um, ever. And that's just from, from demographics, from understanding why that went down to 2.4. But here is, this is actually from Canada, but it is a similar graph on most countries of the world, uh, particularly the Western European, um, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, those. And this is the number of single families headed by a mother or a father. And you can see here that, what, this is back in 1976, so we're talking 45 years ago or so. Combined, it was about 300 or so per thousand, so about a third. Well, now it is up to, oh, this one, sorry, one's lone father families on one side and lone mother families on the other side. Mm -hmm. I was thinking they were both on the same side. Mm -hmm, no, so, and the darker blue is the mother, lone mother, and the lighter blue is the lone father. Yeah. So you are up to now, this is 140 plus 500, 650, 65%. Um, so that's 65% now of children who don't live with one or their parents that there's a, you know, possibility there of not getting to know that side of the family at all. And again, what you end up with is you end up with this branch that nobody's going to be researching, nobody's going to be looking at since there's nobody that is interested in that or they don't know what that side is so really you combine those two of less kids per family overall which means less people interested in genealogy which means more families aren't getting researched and the single parent households going up you have higher chance of not knowing who that other side of the family is right absolutely now um I hope that you understanding why I'm talking about threats is trying to figure out what can you do to help this threat not necessarily be a threat in the future, right? Um, in business, if we don't talk about threats, they come up and they bite us and they destroy businesses. If they only look at opportunities and never look at threats, they destroy businesses. So you as a genealogist, if you think, oh, Devin, you're just making stuff up. You're worried for nothing that you can have that opinion, but at the same time, make sure that you're doing things to foster a love of family, foster a love of heritage. And there are some sensitive messages worth discussing here. Here's one of Mike's kind of hard to have a love for family and history when it becomes fashionable to attack our family and our history in America. Kids today are made to feel ashamed of their heritage. You know what? Mike might be right. He might be wrong. The fact of the matter is, what are we doing to foster a love of our family and our heritage? My family is full of drunks and infidelity, but it also isn't full of people who know how to love, know how to conquer obstacles in their past, right? So our trees aren't perfect. And we there's a video on my YouTube channel, Write Your Family History, about should we criticize our ancestors? Well, go watch that video. <laughs> um, it talks about presentism, right? And how that actually can destroy the path. But could we critique our ancestors? If you're doing it in the right time and place to be sure. So we need to be aware of those threats so that we can take advantage of the things that we said are what we look forward to in genealogy research and genetic genealogy research. Here's a, here's a comment here from Matt I wanted to talk about. Sure. And come on, show. There. Uh, he says, might less or fewer nuclear families lead to more of an interest, maybe later in life, as they want to discover where their ancestors came from? Maybe. Um, I, would, I would say here, historically, though, there's no precedent for it. So we don't know. Um, 
I would I would guess you would say there's a hope of that, mm -hmm. but uh, from a historical precedent, we don't have anything that that tells us anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. Uh, right to be sure, to be sure. Um, and I I like. Three P's: preachers, politician, and prisoners. <laughs> That's about right. You got, you got good, bad, and otherwise. And nothing is to say the preacher was great and the prisoner was was all the way awful, right? And that's something that we need to try to instill in into the future generation. All right. So now is the time for any questions you guys have. There are some comments I want to go through, and um, so they might touch back on some of the. Um, earlier topics. So feel free to leave your comments. All right. So Lucille says she's hoping more records come available if you don't already volunteer to help get those records online. Absolutely. Either index or validate indexing or get active in your community and find the record collections and make it um, known to archivists in your state, make it known to Family Search, My Heritage, Ancestry, so on and so forth. Get those records known so they can be digitized. So volunteer in those ways. All right. Um, now, Stacy says, I think you're going to see genealogy be more accessible. In the past, it was more for the older and wealthier because that was the only way to access records. Andy, your thoughts? You're shaking your head yes. Oh, I'd say absolutely, definitely. Um, and you can see that just right now. Uh, the simple fact that we can access all these records online that literally 20 years ago we could not uh, is is made it more accessible mm -hmm. the question is is just because it's more accessible are more people going to get involved in it sure. um, now the nice thing about that is the fact that it is more accessible it should be easier to help get people involved in it even on a casual basis mm -hmm. because you can you know two in the morning you wake up mm -hmm. and you're can't go to sleep, you can always get on Ancestry or My Heritage or Family Search and do some research. Right. And so much training is available on YouTube, <laughs> like you're watching right now. So that that's a positive. A lot of the hurdles of the, of the past are, are overcoming. All right. Um, Jean says, I hope they can do more to restore lost records. As more and more information is digitized and discovered, I really hope they can combine info to provide info for lost and burned records. I, I, I Yeah. So newspapers is a great substitute for a burned county courthouse. Um, Melissa Barker in a previous live stream, do you remember what that? When she yep. said what um, that, the, uh, that a county was remodeling the courthouse and found a a vault in a wall <laughs> and had lots of records. And the, yeah, the, the future of replacing records with alternative records is pretty profound. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? No. Okay, not on that one. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, sorry. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this one. Um, some Sicilian church records just came online, which helped me tremendously. Deep East Texas, Gulf Coast, South are solid brick walls. So much just not available yet, but OCR newspapers have given me many clues. Yay! I love newspapers. I love newspaper research. And in fact, that's one of the um, classes I'm teaching at Roots Tech in person um, is deep diving into uh, uh, newspaper records. So if you make it out there, I hope you'll check that out. Um, okay, how about this? I'd really like to see AI applied to enhancing damaged handwriting and printed records. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's that's one of the things where AI is going to be very useful. Now, um, AI means lots of different things, but in this case, as you are, I mean, the, the idea here is, is as you're teaching the computer, you, you know, to recognize handwriting, particularly more in very different types of handwriting, one of the things that you have to be able to do is, you know, distinguish between not just the differences in the handwriting, but also the similarities so that you can reconstruct, hey, we've got this, this damage here that we've got looks like two or three letters here. And then there's a break of a couple letters. And then there's a few more letters that the computer can read that and interpolate and say, you know what, based on, you know, the English dictionary or the French dictionary or whatever, and what I know about handwriting, I think this is this word. Um, and, and that, is that possible? Yeah, I think that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, 
How soon? I don't know, uh, because I, I have not been involved in AI development myself or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But from from everything that I've seen already from OCR mm -hmm. and even just regular handwriting recognition. Yeah, it's a it's a step forward. And I think it's going to happen. All right. All right. So this is keeping um, the trend of the various topics going on. Um, this is back to DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to tackle this? Yeah. <laughs> People that transfer their stuff over to GEDmatch would be great if they use the same screen name all the time. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I'm, I think of it, think of this as, okay, I've got to figure out who this person is of this screen name. It's, it's one more genealogy step that if you didn't have to do that, great, but we end up having to do that. <laughs> So maybe the next five years we can have a movement use the same screen name across platforms. That would be great, you know. <laughs> Hashtag use the same name. Use the same name. <laughs> All right. Um, so this goes back to the, um, the the threat of genealogy research. And Matt said, I think it, uh, people who come of age when they consider having children are more interested in knowing where they come from. Yes. My my experience has been that they want to a quick, easy button. And I was going to say with and that's the, that's the problem with a lot of of the uh, snippets you hear about how much popular genealogy is, is it's people it's, it's asking people, hey, would you like to know where you're from? Well, who doesn't um, want to know something about where they're from? But then the follow-up question is, is, are you gonna do anything about it? And for the most people, it's like, well, no, because while they're interested in being told that, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily what they're interested in doing. And I don't wanna fault that because at the same time, would you be interested in, you know, driving a Ferrari? Yeah, absolutely. Are you gonna pay for it? Are you gonna pay for it? Yes, are you gonna pay for it? Or are you gonna learn how to build it yourself? There's some people that want to do that. And there's right. some people that's what they will spend their money on. Right. But trust me, I yeah, if I if given the opportunity to drive a Ferrari and it cost me nothing, absolutely <laughs> I would do that. So if anybody in the genial uh, the the YouTube sphere want to have two genealogists ride a Ferrari. If you have a Ferrari and you'd like us to ride it, I would be more than happy to. All saying about not spending money. I might even fly somewhere to drive your Ferrari, <laughs> but I'm not sure because, you know, that few hundred bucks for the flight might not be worth it for just driving the Ferrari to me. But, and, and, and so really, and that's the case with, with lots of different things because we all have the same amount of time in the day and we all have different priorities of how we're going to use that time and spend that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so genealogy for a lot of people is not anywhere close to one of their priorities. Right. And doesn't mean um, it's not interesting. The other part you said is when they consider having children or start having children, when you start having children, to be perfectly honest, the only thing I tell new moms to do or people with um, kids that are toddlers, whenever they're like, I need to do something with genealogy, I feel like I have, I mean, record stories, record stories record stories. Don't worry about records. Don't worry about trees. Maybe get DNA tests for your oldest living relatives, but let that for later because they are so time consuming and the sleep deprivation makes really dumb mistakes in family trees. So, um, but I'm not saying young people can't be interested. So it, it is something to consider. You do have a point. Um, I just wanted to talk about that. All right. So now, here's another option. Since people live longer today, more children have a chance to meet their older relatives. If any of their relatives live past their 50s. <laughs> so, so this is a trend that kind of ties into, oh, people in the past lived shorter lives. Well, after they got through a certain hurdle, they actually lived fairly long lives. But while people can live longer, hopefully people will take care of themselves because not to throw shade on my parents, they didn't take care of their health and both of them are deceased. So it is, yeah, I hope. I mean, I've met a number of people who are in their 40s and their great grandmas are still alive. I am so freaking jealous. Like, I'm so jealous. Uh, my, my kids happen to have met 
their their grandparents. Um, has anybody met their great grandparents? Yeah, because uh, great grandma Lee came down for the one wedding, and all the kids we went out to dinner and we had breakfast with her. We so. did get to meet great grandma Lee. Mm -hmm. So real quick here, though. Besides that, one of the things here is this is this is. Uh, you want to pull this up? I did. Hold on. So living longer is a positive as far as the chance to meet your older ancestors. On the other hand, um, one of the things that is happening simultaneously with that is the age at which women are giving birth is increasing as well. Um, this is just a graph for the United States of the mean age for the first birth of this. Um, so whereas before having kids, you know, at least uh, a first kid into your 30s was really unheard of. Now, there's lots of women that they're not having their first kid until their 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some that are not having it until their late 30s even. And so when you think about that, if you have a couple of generations where your child wasn't born until you were in your late 30s, well, that's another 15 years difference from what several other generations might have had as far as meeting grandparents and great grandparents. And so mm -hmm. um, that, that I guess is, is one that's gonna be a family by family thing as far as, hey, one, do you have the genes that help you live older? In which case you can meet your great grandparents or in, I'm not sure if you're conscious enough for your great, great grandparents. Cause my, my grandma, when she passed away, she did have two or three great, great grandchildren but they were babies, you know, one, two years old. Um, so, you know, they're not going to necessarily have any memory of her. But uh, but yeah, so it's interesting that you that there's a couple of these different competing things going on that, hey, one would would uh, foster this ability to meet your ancestors and maybe increase that genealogy. Whereas this other instance, uh, we might not be able to meet the great grandparents because we're having babies later in life. And so they're still only a few generations alive at one time. Sure. All right. So let me tackle this one. It says, it breaks my heart. Do you think you view teens as narcissistic, as well as a threat to genealogy work, my career, lack of interest, small offense, broken home, closed challenges. All right. So <laughs> perhaps I didn't say it as clearly. There was someone in the chat who was like, hey, I think you kind of missed the point. When we talk about things that can damage genealogy research, not my career, I don't care about you know that, okay? What can decrease an interest in genealogy research when people only care about themselves? Now, where am I getting this from? This is from personal experiences working with young people. A lot of young people don't care about the past and some people said earlier, that's just being teens. No, not the type of that I'm talking about. There's some people who aren't interested in doing their family history because somebody else will do it for them and just telling the story. No, there are people who are like, I don't care about people who were dead and came before me, period, end of sentence. And that has been increasing over the last 20 years in my interaction with teenagers. And that becomes a threat to be considered. It's, is genealogy work going to increase or not? right? Is it going to increase? Is it going to be around? Is it going to be of interest? People, I'm not saying all teens are narcissistic, but there is an increase in it with so much despise for the past or lack of empathy or caring. And it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with single moms. But when I've worked with teens or young adults who were raised by young um, by single parents being the father and mother, they don't know the other side of the family tree. And it is hard for them, next to impossible for them in many cases. You may say, well, DNA solves the problem. Not necessarily. And that gets really frustrating. So as that increases, it's as it becomes harder for children who do not have a connection to the past, do not know who those um, who the other side of the family tree is, that can become a problem. And so that's what we're getting at. We're not you know, saying it's bad to be a child of a single parent. We're saying this can be a problem. So if you're a single mom, what should you do? Make sure, even if you just like your ex or the father, or because you said a single mom, so there had to be a father somewhere. Even if you dislike them, make sure your children know who 
is part of that side of the family tree. Now you've overcome the threat, right? Anything else you want to share? No. Okay. okay. I did have one here though. This is okay. one that uh, there's come some discussion here um, with some different people. Mm -hmm. Stacy said, I wish the myths would die. People have always lived long lives um, and all this. And, and it boils down to this. And Carol's got this good question. What was the life expectancy of someone born in the mid 19th century compared to today in the Western world? And Carol, I'm going to say that you're asking the wrong question. Mm. Okay. Because if we're just asking about average life expectancy, we can see that average life expectancy has gone up um, until very recently when it is basically leveled off um, with small minor increases or decreases here. However, remember that statistic of life expectancy is all of the people alive divided by all of the people when they died or, you know, one thing like that. When in reality, the vast majority of those deaths were zero to one year old, zero to six months old. Um, you're talking, you know, pre-1800, depending on where you lived in the world, anywhere between a third and two thirds of people died between zero and one year old. Now, there it tapers off there till about five years old or so. And it tapers off some more until you're about 20. And so by the time you're 20, you've survived all the childhood il illnesses. You survived all the uh, bears that you couldn't outrun or anything like that. And so now the question is, is, hey, if you make it to 20 years old, what is your life expectancy? And that has gone up, although not near as dramatically. So, for instance, in uh, if we just just pull a number out of our head and say in 1700, for the world, the average life expectancy was 32 years old, 34 years old. And so you're thinking, oh, people must be dying all over the place when they're 34. No, people are dying all over the place when they're six months old. And some people are dying when they're five years old and a few more when they're 15. By the time they're 20, they're going to live a pretty decent life. Now, does it mean that they were living to 80 and 90 all the time? No, there were some people that did. But if you, in 1700, if you made it to 20 years old, your life expectancy was probably, I'd have to go look up the numbers, probably 60 years old or so. Uh, so less than what it is today, but not tons less. And so that's why, you know, uh, who was it? Stacy mentioned that she's got several great, great grandmas that lived into their 90s and stuff. Yeah. And if you look at, you know, some of these historical figures, you see that, oh, wait, they lived till they were like 95 or 85 or 75. You know, when life expectancy was 34 at the time, it's like, well, no, they lived till they were 20 and they made it that far, which means that they're going to have basically a, a good long life. Um, and so that's one of the things that's, that's really complicated when we're looking at life expectancy and comparing it is you can't really compare overall life expectancy. You really got to compare it by age. Mm -hmm. What's the life expectancy of a 20 year old in 1900 versus 2000? And how much different is that? All right. A couple more questions before we wrap it up. We do have a live stream um, after this one for channel members. So, Andy, how will the metaverse affect genealogy? <laughs> um, I have no idea because, one, i not in the metaverse. <laughs> um, so, now, saying that, I will say this. I know that there has been a Second Life genealogy group or something. That is Second Life is like a platform sort of like the metaverse. That's been going on for like 10, 15 years, ever since Second Life came out. Um, and I know that they have meetups there and do other things. Um, and so if it is something that can be used for it, I think there will always be a niche of people who will use that. Doesn't mean that I'm going to. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's another, another one. I'm looking forward to the use of facial recognition becoming more commonplace. Um, more commonplace. Two things. One, the Photoshop Elements has had a facial recognition tool within it for the last 10, 15 years. Maybe not 15. I know for 10, 
Um, because I was heavily doing digital scrapbooking 10 years ago using Photoshop elements exclusively. And they had this facial recognition that was really good. Oh my gosh, it could spot like a half turned face of my little guy um, Cinco, and then it recognized as he grew older. Oh my gosh, that's insane. Um, and so it is there. I'm not sure what more commonplace means. Um, the other problem with facial recognition software is just because it could recognize somebody doesn't mean it knows who the person is. So it would be nice if it could be used in websites like Dead Fred, you know, to figure out who it is. But somebody has to know who that person is initially. So um, anyway, uh, tell me more why why you think that would be um, a good tool. Uh, just clarify it some more. And tell me what you think. All right. Um, in the next five years, making family histories more interesting thing with photos, family trees, possibly videos. Absolutely. Okay. So Photoshop Elements. It was expensive and it was hard to use uh, twenty years ago. About 10 years ago, it became so easy and relatively affordable. And that's just that tool. And then they have Photoshop Elements Premiere for video editing. Love that tool. But not everybody can use it. And yet there's other tools. In fact, you can create things in Canva, which I thought, oh, my gosh, that's really insane. The, the ability to publish books, that's something I talk a lot about on Write Your Family History, it is super cheap to publish a book on Lulu.com or make an ebook or things of that nature. But there are so many great tools to make it visual, to make it portable. But the thing you have to do, because I just talked to somebody about this last week, is you got to make sure it's in a format that can transfer to another format. So she had audio recordings of her grandma on a PDA, a Palm Pilot. And there isn't a technology that they're aware of right now that can make content out of the PDA. So they saved it <laughs> because they want the audio out. But I don't even know if that that, that technology would die like they're over this time. I don't know if it's even still on there anymore. But um, if you put it into a technology, you need to be able to get it out. So... Um, lots of comments coming. There's, real quick, just so before you start, there's actually been a couple of questions on this for uh, the uh -huh. member only. Yes. How do, we, how do we get to the next video? Okay, so there is a link in the description box for this video that links to the next video. And uh, as you can tell, I'm here. I'm not there yet. I'll be there soon. But um, you have to be a, mem a member. So you have to click the join button. It costs $2.99 a month. And then you'll be able to attend our members only training and access the deep archive. I don't think people are taking advantage of the deep archive of previous lives, writing deep dives, research deep dives, DNA deep dives. There's playlist on our playlist page that says members only training and you can and they're all segmented by topic. And you can go in there once you hit the join button, just like uh, who's our new baby, baby McTeer. All right. Yeah. You're a new member. So you'll be able to, to, to watch that. Um, like what else? Is That's that it? it. That's it. All right. So thank you for joining this discussion about the future of genealogy research. Remember there are strengths, there's weaknesses, there are opportunities and threats, things we're excited about, things we wish would change, like using the hashtag, use the same name. <laughs> um, but if we're aware of these things, if we're worried about something, do something positive to continue genealogy for the benefit of more and more people. Because I truly believe in my heart of hearts that family history research has the power to help you understand the path, strengthen your present, and improve your future. Bye, guys. See you later.